Hello and welcome. Thank you for connecting on today's call. We'll continue with our study in the book of Hebrews. I would like to request uh, one of us on the call to please lead in prayer. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you under the name of Jesus. I thank you for this day. Thank you for the class you're about to have, God. May your spirit guide us uh, as we learn the truth, Jesus. Help us to be fully convinced in our faith and uh, to apply the truths in our life so that we can be a blessing to us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, uh, let's begin. We were in Hebrews chapter 7, and we saw yesterday how uh, beautiful the priesthood of our Lord Jesus is, how God has appointed him. He has not become a priest uh, by himself. And we saw of a better order, the order of Melchizedek, which is uh, where the Lord Jesus uh, derives his priesthood from and we also saw that he has become the mediator of the new covenant which has better promises for us and because he is the co-signer the son of god who has already redeemed us the power of sin over our lives is broken and we are also empowered to live victorious uh, for god in and through our lives. So this is something that we have looked at so far. And we were at the passage or we were at the scripture, Hebrews 7.25, where we saw that the Lord Jesus, he saves us to the uttermost. So the work that he has done for us is so powerful that the worst of sinners who comes to him can still experience this redemption that we are talking about. Now we look at the last two verses here and move on to uh, chapter 8 of Hebrews, uh, last three verses. So would someone like to read, please? Verse 26 to verse 27, Hebrews 7. 26 to 28, three verses. Verse 26, for such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the people's for this he did once for all when he offered up himself for the law appoints as high priests men who have weakness but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the son who has been perfected forever Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rosalind. As we can see here, talking about the priesthood of our Lord Jesus, uh, he is described, his character is described for us as one who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, uh, and has become higher than the heavens. So again, he is set apart compared to all other priests that ever existed. Yes, he is compassionate. Yes, he's someone who understands our weaknesses. But at the same time, we are so clear that he is holy. He's separate from sinners uh, and that he is undefiled. He's harmless, but the, at the same time, he is undefiled. So that is unique to Jesus. We can't say this about any other high priest. We may probably use uh, terms such as harmless for them to talk about their compassion, but we can never boldly say that they were sinless. It's only Jesus who can take credit for that. 
uh, being compassionate as well as being holy or sinless uh, and we know that he has become higher than the heavens that simply uh, refers to the kind of priesthood that he has he is the priest in the true tabernacle okay the true tabernacle is in heaven we uh, will see later on that the tabernacle that moses built it was but a picture of the real tabernacle of heaven so who is the high priest in the real tabernacle it's jesus christ so he's become higher than the heavens he's the greatest high priest of all high priests who ever lived and verse 27 it uh, states who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the peoples for this he did once for all when he offered up himself so quite a lot in that one verse there it's saying that jesus is a perfect high priest just as verse 27 said it stated that he is undefiled and holy so he's already perfect uh, he does not have to bring up any sacrifices for his own sins or the sins of the people now the other aspect that is included in this verse 28 is that he offered up himself okay so notice so far we've been saying jesus the high priest the great high priest now we are getting an understanding that he's a sacrifice also okay so unique so unique he's god he's the high priest he's our brother like you can keep talking so much about christ and yesterday we said that uh, he's the fulfillment of all things that uh, we were waiting for and in the old covenant there were many practices that were instituted but the lord jesus is the fulfillment of them all he also is our sacrifice while he is our high priest and verse 28 it states for the law appoints as high priest men who have weaknesses but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the son who has been perfected forever so uh, in essence it's saying that this high priest is so great in every way uh, mainly because he's perfect he's sinless he did not have to make a sacrifice for himself he became a sacrifice but we know he became a sacrifice for us ultimately to save us so that's about the priesthood of our lord jesus christ let's move on we'll still talk some more about his priesthood uh, we'll read from hebrews chapter 8 verses 1 to 6 so if someone can pick that up and read through that would be wonderful now, now, this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also has something to offer for if we for if he were on earth he would not be a priest since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly thing as moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the the uh, pinnacle for his say see that you make all things according to the Veteran shown you on the mountain, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. Uh, thank you, Zeli. Uh, maybe the next time, uh, I don't know who was the other person who wanted to read but couldn't uh, maybe the next time uh, lubega was it so you can please read all right so let's go ahead and understand these six verses so we've been talking about the priesthood of uh, jesus an additional truth about his priesthood that we learn in verse one 
it states that who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens so on the earth we know that the high priest could enter the holy of holies which is the place of the presence of god so there was that permission given to the high priest uh, but when you talk about jesus as a high priest he is in the very presence of god where is god seated he is in the heavens and jesus is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens so think about that on earth the maximum that uh, human high priest could reach to was you know experiencing uh, the presence of god coming upon them but it's only jesus who's actually in heaven in the in the place that hosts god and he's right there how close is he to god he's at the right hand seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens he's a glorious high priest is a glorious high priest because no one could get access to god the way jesus has so that's another thing so beautiful we depend on jesus as a high priest he's sinless he's compassionate he gives aid to those who are being tempted he understands our weaknesses and he's glorious he's right there you know next to the father up in heaven there's no other high priest who's ministering from heaven directly but that would be jesus for us verse 2 it says a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the lord erected and not man so as i shared some time ago there is something known as the true tabernacle what is that the true tent of worship it's heaven because it's in heaven where god dwells where the lord is worshiped where he sits enthroned and that's the place you know where uh, god receives his worship so all other high priests they ministered out of an earthly tabernacle but it's only jesus who's minister of the true tabernacle minister of the sanctuary and the true tabernacle which is heaven itself and who's who set up that tabernacle the earthly tabernacle we had human beings constructing it by the instruction of god but the heavenly tabernacle set up by god himself and where is our great high priest ministering in the very presence of god so you know his office is better than everybody else's office okay it's heaven he has a place in heaven okay so that's the beauty verse 3 it says every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices therefore it is necessary that this one also have something to offer so he is doing the duties or taking up the responsibilities of a high priest uh, it states here that there are gifts and sacrifices so if we go back to the levitical priesthood we'll read so many about you know so many sacrifices so many offerings de depending on the situation and how the person came in many different things were offered up to god but we know in the case of our lord jesus that he ultimately offered himself up for us as a one off sacrifice and we'll read about it you know the the author will not miss that he'll talk about the most precious sacrifice of which we have in our lord jesus himself so now we are talking about jesus as a high priest of the heavenly tab tabernacle so let's continue along those lines verse 5 he says the earthly tabernacle it served as a copy and shadow we use those words copy and shadow of the heavenly things so uh, what did god intend god wanted man to understand worship he wanted man to um, you know understand how to approach god he wanted him to understand what it would take 
to get into God's presence. That's why, you know, sacrifices and gifts and offerings, all of those things were instituted. We, we, we see uh, every furniture in the tabernacle, it had some meaning. Uh, when, when we look at the lamp, it has a meaning. You know, when we uh, talk about the incense, it has a meaning. The table of showbread, it has a meaning. And everything is talking about a deeper truth. So when uh, something is pointing to the deeper truth, it's a shadow. It exists, but that's not the main thing. Something better is ahead of it. So these things were a shadow. They were talking about something greater. And a copy, we know that. Copy is nothing but an image of of uh, the structure of heaven, structure of worship of heaven was sort of given to Moses to copy it. And you make an earthly tabernacle and it will give people the idea of uh, you know how to worship, how to approach God uh, and all of those things. So Moses divinely instructed by God. Think about this, you know. God did not do a haphazard random job and say, Moses, you make whatever you want. Let it be the way you, you like it. But there were clear instructions because God was trying to communicate something. You know, when we study about the tabernacle, it's so beautiful, like uh, starting from the tent and what was covering the tent, you know, the layers of uh, the fabric which was covering the tent. Uh, I've heard some some people preach uh, and of course you know they use uh, some parts to confirm with scripture but then there are many others which are like allegorical that's not the best way and that's not the most accurate way but still you know there are those pictures of the sacrifice of jesus uh, and uh, the blood of jesus as you look at the components of the tabernacle also Jesus is revealed to us, right? So it's so beautiful the way God instructed Moses. Um, if you look at the Ark of the Covenant, I heard somebody talk about the Ark of the Covenant and how it's layered with gold. You know, one portion is gold and then there's a little bit of wood. Uh, these are all pictures. Gold is divinity. Uh, wood is humanity. So uh, God spoke beautifully about his son, the Lord Jesus, about redemption, okay? Uh, and uh, everything that's going to happen, you know, the way the blood was put on the Ark of the Covenant and the, the material inside the Ark of the Covenant would be, uh, would come under the blood uh, and that God would meet, uh, his presence will, will come on the Ark of the Covenant. Everything has a meaning. Everything has a meaning. Uh, and so what Moses was doing, whether he understood it or not, thank God he was obedient. You know, he didn't ask God the question, why why gold, Lord? Why can't I use, you know, uh, some silver? Why can't I use pearls? He obeyed. Even when the menorah, I think it's it's beaten out of one one metal and it's made. There's a reason behind everything why God said you should do it that way. He was obedient to it. But here's the the point that this verse is trying to tell us. The point is they were a copy of the heavenly tabernacle. So God was trying to establish a pattern for us to view and hopefully understand uh, you know what worship was all about who god was and how to approach him and god told him see verse 5 it says uh, he said see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain okay so clear instructions to moses and in verse 6 says but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry in as much as he is also mediator of the better covenant which was established on better promises so this we've already discussed jesus as the co-signer because he um, uh, has forgiven us he's broken the power of sin over our lives and he has also empowered us to live a victorious life now better promises it says what are these better promises um, you know as we read about the different covenants that God has established, whether it is 
covenant with Abraham, covenant with David. You will always have somebody sitting on your throne. Those promises are wonderful. And it talk about, uh, they talk about the blessings of God in people's lives. But when we finally come to the cross, right? There are so many promises that become ours. You know, Jesus became the curse for us. We read that in Galatians 3, verse 13. You know, he, he became the curse. He hung on the tree so that the blessings of Abraham may come to us. So the covenant promises which he had given to uh, his men of old, people like Abraham, you know, other godly men, because of what Jesus has done, Every curse has been removed and those blessings came on us. Now, because of the cross, there are additional promises. You know, when we especially study about who we have become in Christ, we will know so much has happened for us in Christ Jesus. You know, I am a child of God. I am redeemed. I am blessed. I am victorious. I am triumphant. We can go on and on and on. So many promises that we have. You know, God blesses the work of my hands. The Lord causes me to prosper. The Lord uh, gives me victory uh, over my enemies. He, he, he teaches me to, to profit. So many bless blessings, promises. In fact, the whole word of God, which is in our hands, the promises of God come alive to us. And as a child of God, you know, I have the book of promises. I can keep claiming each promise and keep walking ahead uh, triumphantly. So that has been made possible because we now have a better covenant with better promises, which is mediated by whom? None other than the Lord Jesus himself. So he made a new covenant with us. OK, think about this. Everything seems to be new, isn't it? The priesthood, we've seen the old priesthood, but now this is a new priesthood through Melchizedek. And now, all of a sudden, new covenant, old covenant, not good enough. New covenant established through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's move on. Let's read from verse 7 to verse 13. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for the second, for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor, and none his brother, saying, saying Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. In that, he says, a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Amen. Amen. And thank you, Lupeka. Thank you for reading that uh, section there. So it clearly says that God wants to make a new covenant because the old one was not good enough. Um, and uh, this new covenant is made through the redemptive work of our Lord Jesus, because we know when we talk about covenant, there's a shedding of blood. Uh, and Jesus did it. He shed his blood and uh, he uh, made this covenant. So when we uh, look at the word new, the old one was not good enough, right? That's why we needed a new one. So generally, the word that is used for new uh, in the Greek in most places apparently is uh, neos. Neos means newness in regards to time. But the word that is used here for the new is Kainos, kainos, okay, kainos, uh, which 
not only refers to newness in terms of time, but newness in terms of quality. So it's like putting away uh, something old and bringing in something better. It's new because it's it's coming right now and it's better. So that's the word for the new covenant that is used, kainos, something wonderful that has been given to us. Now, looking at the old covenant that God made with his people, he wanted them to keep the covenant. And we know the children of Israel time and again, they failed. They were disobedient to God. They were rebellious. They were stiff-necked. They were complaining. Uh, and, and they displeased God because of their behavior. Uh, but this time around, the covenant that God is making with his people, it's one of redemption. We see his mercy he says that he's going to write it on the hearts of the people uh, and that you know they will be able to live it. How will they be able to live it? Because the, the redemptive work of Jesus empowers us to live it. Earlier, People couldn't because there was nothing empowering them. They were only given the instructions and said, okay, you need to live like this. And they were not able to. They broke, you know, they broke the rules and obviously they could not keep the covenant. But as far as the new covenant is concerned, there is the uh, there is the redeeming work of Christ. There is the empowering that comes from what he has done. Uh, and so as believers, we can actually live it out, okay? this new covenant which uh, he makes with us. And God says that you know, he will put it uh, on our hearts. It will be one that will transform us from within. It won't be a covenant of external laws. Okay, like the mosaic one, but uh, it will be transformative from within us. We will be able to live it out. There'll be God's mercy and grace um, helping us through this process of living out the covenant. And uh, you know, this this covenant is uh, literally you know, the one that we are going to live out by uh, being close to our God. You know, being uh, walking in intimacy with our Lord Jesus Christ, and there are you know many differences of the Old and New Testament. If we want to compare and see, uh, we can also talk about the differences. So I have a a few things jotted down here. I'll quickly read it out for us. So the Old Covenant was established through Moses, and it you know, dates back to somewhere 1446 BC. Whereas the new covenant, uh, we, we are uh, referring to the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? So the crucifixion, that's about 33 AD is when the new covenant was established with us. The old covenant uh, came in through Moses as the mediator, the new one with Jesus as the mediator. The old one uh, was about external laws. It it caused a sense of awe and fear among the people. Even when you know it was given to Moses, uh, there, there's this whole way of giving it the thunder and the lightning on the mountain when he receives uh, the the. Uh, law from God. Whereas when we look at the new covenant, it's not about just about keeping the promises. God is saying it's going to be transformative where God will put it in our hearts. That is one thing. Uh, secondly, there is grace, God's grace. Because earlier for every small thing, there needed to be a sacrifice. And uh, the priest, that's why they, they were keeping up the temple practices because someone had to pay the price. But now the ultimate price has already been paid. So this is a this is something new that we are living in right now under the new covenant. It has never happened. This experience uh, was not there for those living under the old covenant. This kind of freedom, uh, this kind of uh, uh, you know a sense of liberty, they never had. But we live under the new covenant that speaks about freedom, liberty, uh, and grace. Right, because Jesus has become that one perfect sacrifice for us. The old covenant, um, it had to do with works, so people had to live it out in order to fulfill it. But how about the new covenant? 
the new covenant it's about accepting the work of jesus on the cross so it's about faith right uh, and that's how we are going to live it out the old old um, covenant uh, is part of the uh, aaronic priesthood that we've seen the new one uh, it's from the order of melchizedek the old one uh, had many imperfections imperfect sacrifices were were given and there was endless repetition of uh, practices under the old covenant whereas under the new covenant it got sealed the moment jesus paid the price for us it's done you know it's not repetitive uh, we'll study later on that there was only need for one perfect sacrifice so we no longer have to continue uh, you know sometimes as christians we ask the question what about the jewish temple practices why don't we why don't we follow all those things we don't need it that one ultimate sacrifice was already made for us and that is what the new covenant is all about so we don't have to go back to the imperfect sacrifices and the repetitive uh, practices uh, the old covenant you could say that it was written on tablets but what did we read in this passage the new covenant is written on the hearts of the people okay so beautiful uh, yeah, so uh, I, I think we can just keep going on and on, but uh, I, I probably just stop with those. So there are all these differences that we observe in both the old and the new covenants. So we'll pause for a bit before we proceed on to chapter nine here. Uh, so if there are there are any thoughts or comments, let's take it up. Yeah, sure. We'll go to that. Uh, I think Lubega has raised his hand. We'll take up Lubega's question first. Yeah, yes, sir, Lubega, please go ahead. There is a commentary that I was reading. Yeah. Which was like saying that the reason, some of the reasons, I don't know whether it is from just inquiring, but some of the reasons why the new covenant was supposed to be made was because. The old one was only with the nation of Israel, and this one was an international one, which was going to put into perspective the Gentiles too. How is your take on that one? Okay. Mm. So I haven't studied it thoroughly, but I like you remember when we did the book of Acts, we talked about a category of people known as the proselytes. So there were those who put their trust in Jesus who came from outside the Jewish community. So that, I think there was some provision uh, under the old covenant also, Lubega. That's what, that's what I can understand. But of course, with the new covenant coming in, it's very clearly opened up to the whole world. Is that, is that fine? Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Okay, so uh, Jeffina had a question about verse 11 of Hebrews 8. It says, none of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, know the Lord, for all shall know me and the least of them to the greatest of them. So this simply means uh, that all can have a personal relationship with God. That's the essence of what it is stating here under the new covenant. Because earlier, there were people appointed for roles and responsibilities such as leadership, kings, priests, prophets. And people needed to go only to them in order to know what God is saying or doing. But under the new covenant now, all of us as believers, we have the Holy Spirit living inside us. We can have our own personal walk with the Lord. We've become children of God. So that's what it means. And even though it says none of them shall teach his neighbor, it's not literal. It's not literal. It's one means we will know God personally as individuals. Is that okay, Jafina? Or do you still have any...
so one question that comes from here is because it says um, none of them shall teach his neighbor then why do we have teachers you know why should we teach each other uh, this thought is repeated in 1 john chapter 2 verse 27 you know you have the anointing in you which will teach you all things then why do we need teachers so you see when we study uh, the bible we have to let scripture interpret scripture so do these passages mean that we don't need external teachers if you look at other passages of scripture right like the fivefold ministry offices there are teachers there and uh, you know there were teachers in the early church so when you see things like that which are seemingly contradictory we understand that these verses don't mean that you don't need anybody to teach you yes we can learn on our own in the case that there are no teachers holy spirit is with us he'll guide us but there is a role for teachers of god's word so there will still be people who will be there to teach god's word to help us walk rightly with god okay good really uh, good questions there any other I was just thinking to myself that, uh, you know, the, these passages are such in the book of Hebrews uh, that sometimes you can dwell in it for as much time as you would like. Okay. Uh, hopefully over the years, there's been a little bit of improvement. I remember the first time, well, first time or second time, I don't know, we taught Hebrews. Uh, uh, like uh, Hebrews was a subject given to me. Hebrews chapter 1, right? It went on for I don't know how many classes. Uh, by the time we wrapped up and came to Hebrews chapter 4, uh, we had completed some nine classes or something like that. And I was so worried that we'll never be able to finish. Uh, but yeah, we are just glancing through. So I encourage you to make your personal effort to study the book of Hebrews, even literally word to word, because there is so much in there, so much. Um, like Even if we just go back to Hebrews 8 just now, and we saw gifts and sacrifices, right? Every priest has to offer gifts and sacrifices. sacrifices under the old testament what are the gifts and sacrifices that you know jesus has offered up as a high priest we'll discover many things we also you know recognize as we go through the book of hebrews that uh, and other books of the bible that god has now made us kings and priests so if we are priests we do have to offer up something to God. What are those spiritual sacrifices? Okay, we'll come to that. What are those spiritual sacrifices that we must offer? So there, there, there's like so much of depth that we can go into word by word, uh, verse by verse. And uh, yeah, so please make that effort and uh, do spend time gaining the most out of the book of Hebrews. Uh, I think I'll just stop here. We can always pick up chapter 9 in the next class. So we've completed till chapter 8. If uh, you have any additional thoughts, let's start with that in the next class. Uh, any questions or reflections? And then we'll pick up from chapter 9. OK, uh, sure. So we'll stop here. If there's nothing more to discuss, we can pray.
Who would like to pray today? We someone who hasn't prayed in in a while. Uh, let's okay. pray. Yes, John. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this opportunity. Once again, you have given us to learn from your word. Thank you that you are a high priest. Thank you that you are our uh, covenant keeping God. Thank you that you are uh, always our intercessor, God. And thank you for unveiling all these truths to us, Lord Jesus. And we pray that we will continue to have this revelation and be deeply rooted uh, in this word of God. We pray and ask for your grace to understand this even better every time we read, oh God. We thank you, oh God. We thank you for this time of learning. We thank you for anointing person Nancy. We, we humble ourselves once again. In Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, John. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, uh, almost end of uh, it's already end of the first month so you can expect some tests and assignments to come your way okay just a heads up there and uh, yeah bye for now have a great week ahead bye